Hello YouTube and welcome to this video on how to land a helicopter. It's a follow on from our previous video on how to take off. We'll cover both single engine and multi-engine helicopters, looking at large clear area landing techniques, confined areas, multi-engine Cate VTOL profiles, with examples from both inside and outside the cockpit. We'll first start with a single engine helicopter, looking at landings at an airfield, using the constant angle technique in the Robinson 44, R66, and the MD500 helicopter, both at day and night. Now, the flight manual of each helicopter provides guidance on the approach profiles to fly, but it is important to point out that the height velocity diagram, the dead man's curve, which is used to illustrate where a safe auto rotation may and may not be achieved, does not apply to the initial stages of approach and landing. A helicopter can make a shallow, constant angle or a steep approach to a landing spot, depending on the type of the obstacles on the approach path. The final section of the landing may involve touching down to the ground using a hover landing or a no hover landing if there's blowing sand, snow or limited power, or even a running landing in the event of limited power control or tail road to malfunction and it's down to the pilot to select the relevant technique for each and every landing site for the conditions at the time for example wind altitude temperature weight and performance of the helicopter so for a normal single engine approach the helicopter will turn onto the final approach track aligned with the front landing area at about five to six hundred feet above the ground and be established around about 60 knots from this point, the approach angle and the closure rate is judged by eye as you adjust your ground speed, compensating for any wind that exists. The rate of descent should be around 500 feet per minute, and as long as the airspeed is maintained at greater than about 30 to 40 knots, there is no risk of entering a phenomenon known as a vortex ring state, where the helicopter can ent enter an uncontrolled descent that cannot be immediately corrected with raising the collective. This technique involves selecting the correct sight picture of the designated landing spot on the windshield. When it comes into view, lowering the collective and then adjusting it up and down to keep the descent angle constant. If the spot moves up the windshield, then you're too low on the approach path and need to add collective to reduce the rate of descent. The risk of being too low to, on the approach is that you may potentially be closer to any obstacles underneath the approach path. If the landing site appears to move down the windshield, you're too high and need to lower the collective the risk with this is an excessively steep approach and there's a tendency then to slow the helicopter and increase the rate of descent to try and bring you back on the correct path which could put you in the conditions of vortex ring and you wouldn't have enough time or height above the ground to correct this in time. As you descend you'll maintain what appears to be a slow walking pace as you get closer to the ground so you'll naturally slow the helicopter down until you arrive in the hover. The apparent rate of closure and the apparent ground speed is controlled with the cyclic, whilst the angle of approach is controlled by the collective lever. By the time you pass through about 30 knots indicated airspeed, the rate of descent should be around 300 feet per minute. And as you pass over 50 feet of the landing area, the sight picture appears to slide down the windshield to go underneath the helicopter. As you go through translational lift, the main rotor and tail rotor lose the efficiency, so a slight raising of the collective and power pedal is required to slowly bring the helicopter into a stable hover over the landing area. The technique used for the touchdown landing to the ground after the approach is the same regardless if you're flying a single or multi-engine helicopter from the hover. The direction you are pointing, the heading, is maintained using the tail rotor pedals. The lateral position is controlled using the cyclic to stop any movement, and the collective lever is slowly lowered to reduce the height into a low and lower hover to move safely on the ground. In a single engine helicopter, if there was any engine malfunction on the approach, a safe auto rotative landing has to be carried out, so be aware of what is underneath the helicopter when you're coming into land. This is an example of a practice auto rotation that's being carried out to Denham Airfield in an R22 helicopter. As with all of these single engine approaches, if the approach has been misjudged and you're too high, too low, or the landing area is no longer safe, for example, people have walked onto the landing pad, then a go-around should be flown, and that's where max available power is applied and the collective is raised, and you climb away at the best rate of climb speed. The standard helicopter approach angle to a clear area is around 10 to 15 degrees, which is steeper than the equivalent fixed wing approach, which is around 3 degrees. 
You can see this when you fly to a runway that has a visual approach path indicator lighting system. And if you fly the correct three degree glide path, you will be flying a far shallower approach than normal. This is an example of a Robinson R44 helicopter landing at Oxford Airport. This sort of approach lighting system can be very helpful when landing at night, when judging distance and depth perception can be more challenging. We'll now have a look at landings into smaller, confined areas. Different approach angle techniques can be used instead of using a single angle approach described previously. You can use a double angle or a vertical descent. Using the double angle method, you perform an approach to just above the height of the obstacle that obscures your landing area. Once you've safely cleared this, you can then adjust your descent to perform the final section of the landing at a steeper angle. This requires adjusting the collective lever to control the rate of descent whilst reducing the ground speed with the aft cyclic input. This is an example of a confined area landing in a Robinson R66 helicopter. At this point, the descent angle is adjusted for a steeper descent to the landing area. The final single engine method we would look at is the vertical descent. This approach is used when there's obstacles both ahead and behind the landing area. Before going into the confined area, you should consider the five S's and the two W's. First of all, size. Is it large enough? Secondly, shape. What direction gives you the longest landing run? Thirdly, what are the surround to the landing area? What's the best direction for approach? And what would you do in the event of an engine failure? Fourthly, slope. Where is the slope on the surface and which skid is best upslope? And finally, what's the surface? Will you get any benefit from ground effect? Is there any foot or foreign object debris that you need to be worried about, such as loose branches? Then, additionally, consider two Ws. What's the wind direction? Are there any wires? Which way in and which way out are you going to use? And then, in the winter, you can consider the effect of the sun. If the sun is low in the sky, it may cause a temporary blindness as you come in for the approach. For a vertical descent, you make an approach to above the height of the highest obstacle. Once established in the hover, you then select forward onside markers and descend vertically downwards to the landing area. We'll now move on to multi-engine CAT A helicopter operations. Now, for a full description of CAT A versus CAT B operation, please watch the start of the video on takeoff profiles. 
In short, however, when performing a cat A approach, a set landing decision point, or LDP, is defined in terms of speed and height from the landing point. If the correct profile is flown within the weight, altitude and temperature limits set by the manufacturer, if there is an engine malfunction before this landing point, the pilot can safely abort the landing, known as abort landing, or continue on the remaining engine to land at the designated area. If there's an engine failure after this LDP, the pilot is committed to landing safely using the power from the remaining engine. As with single engine helicopters, there are different landing profiles depending on the size and the area of the helicopter is going to. Firstly, a clear area landing, such as an open field or runway. For the EC-135, for example, this area has to be at least 220 metres long and 15 metres wide. The LDP is defined as 40 knots and 100 feet above the landing area. Once through this gate, you're committed to landing. This is an example of an Airbus EC-135 helicopter landing at Cardiff City Heliport in Wales. If there's an engine failure before LDP and the pilot elects to do a balked landing, the correct procedure is to raise the collective to obtain the maximum one engine in op power and to increase the airspeed to the takeoff safety speed, 45 knots in this case, to start to climb to get clear of the obstacles. If decide to continue the approach and landing, the correct procedure is to raise the collective to the OEI engine performance limit and then to select the landing attitude and use the remaining power to cushion the landing. This is the same procedure that you would follow if the engine failure occurred after the landing decision point as well. Next up is the vertical takeoff and landing, or VTL1 profile. There are slight differences between these profiles depending on the height of any obstructions ahead and behind of the landing area. For the EC145 helicopter, for example, the LDP is defined as 30 knots and 100 feet above the landing area. The landing area must be 20 meters wide and have a 32 meter wide clear area around it. This is an example of an Airbus EC-145 helicopter landing at London Battersea Heliport. Now, there are other techniques that can be used in specialist operations, such as ship deck operations, or when landing in loose snow, where whiteout, or landing in blown sand, where brownout conditions can occur, and care is made to minimise the time spent in the degraded visual environment. Pinnacle approaches, or landing on high altitude mountain plateaus, also involve a different procedure. To find out more about the challenges of mountain flying, check out our two-part video on this subject. That's all for now. I hope you found the video informative and thanks for watching.